All right, so it's time to begin. Welcome everybody to our side event, Walking and Cycling, Improving Lives and Transforming Cities. It's really great to be here as part of the, the fifth ministerial session uh, of, of the Transport, Health and Environment Pan-European Program. It's really an honor to be here for the first time, at least for me and, and from SLOWCAT, um, and working with all of you to put on this really interesting and great session as part of this wide program of side events before we kick off the high level events next week. So my name is, is Christopher Decky. I work in policy advocacy, strategy and engagement at the SLOWCAT Partnership for Sustainable Low Carbon Transport. And I'm really happy to welcome all of you here today. Uh, just a few housekeeping things before we begin and I hand off to our opening speaker to kind of set the stage for our event. Um, I just want you all to know that we will be using the chat function to post questions and have discussions. So do feel free to use the chat function as part of the Hotbin program and do join us in the discussion. During the panel, which happens after this, we'll have a number of opportunities for all of you to post questions to our panelists. So do feel free to use the chat function in the Hopin program. Um, this is an English speaking event. We do not have any interpretation, just so you all know. So there won't be an interpretation into the other languages available here. It will be an English only event. Um, we were hoping to do some polls with all of you, but I'm not sure if we're able to, to actually use the, the poll feature, but we'll keep you posted if we're able to insert those polls into, into the poll feature of Hopin. Um, and keep in mind the webinars, as all webinars are for the PEP, are recorded and will be made available through the conference website later on. Um, so now I want to go ahead and introduce our opening speaker, Arturo Seinberth, who is working with me in the SLOWCAT partnership in research, analysis, and engagement. Arturo has a background in transport planning for cities and capacity building with national and local governments, as well as the private sector and civil society organizations. And he's really going to give us um, a bit of an introduction some of the, the, a taste or a teaser of what we're gonna be discussing in this session. So Arturo, if you can unblock your, your video and unmute yourself, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Arturo. Thank you very much, Christopher. And thanks everyone for the opportunity to be able to give some encouraging words as part of this truly important event. It is an honor for me as secretariat of the SLOCA partnership present in this fifth high-level meeting on transport, health, and environment for the Pan-European program, uh, an event that highlights one of the most underrated impacts that transport and mobility currently has on all of us, and that's on our health. Access to transport and mobility is key to our daily activities. We need to satisfy or to access and satisfy our needs, whether it's to go to education centers or jobs, to meet with friends or even to exercise. When we look at transport, we have commonly just thought on how to move people and goods quickly, but we tend to minimize the effects uh, short term and long term that our decisions have on people. A late Costa Rican scholar uh, from where I'm from, Mauricio Leandro, once said that transport, uh, transport professionals are also health professionals. Our decisions as transport professionals have caused negative impacts that we did not intend, and we have sacrificed our health and well being in the process. We lose an annual estimate of 1.35 million lives due to road crashes, with another 20 to 50 million people deemed injured. We contribute to the more than 3.5 million deaths due to poorer quality through and particulate matter coming from. We also have an impact on long-term uh, illnesses, both cardiovascular and respiratory, among which ischemic heart disease and strokes are the two main causes of death worldwide. They are both influenced by a lack of physical activity. And to date, our transport and mobility planning has not been the most helpful to promote healthy lifestyles. We have mainly planned for transport mode in which we are required to do little effort and that at the same time puts fear in the people around us. One of the main barriers cited by people to not walk or cycle more is that they don't feel safe in the roads. It clearly falls on us to create safer and healthier spaces. Another hugely neglected impact has been our mental health. Before the pandemic, the stress generated by congestion took a toll on people. Also for workers in the freight sector, long hours of work and their 
associated long-term health effects that needed to be taken care of. During the pandemic, these effects have taken a backseat to the mental health strains felt by people having their lives changed overnight. Nonetheless, the restrictions put in place by governments all over the world have allowed us to realize about and enjoy the benefits of having less vehicles on the streets and more access to our public space. These situations where we get to walk and cycle in safer and cleaner environments have resulted in massive increases in people walking or cycling for different purposes, such as relieving stress, commuting, or just as part of their jobs, uh, having to work on vehicles or bicycles in this case. We need the conditions that enable us that this will become a permanent new normal from now onwards. Less road crashes, less noise, better air quality, streets reclaimed for the social interaction among people across all ages, which is extremely important, and abilities uh, that all can contribute to the livable and healthier cities that we're trying at this local partnership we championed the sustainable low carbon transport revolution with ambition, solutions, and collaboration. And we do believe that the transport and mobility professionals are also health professionals. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to devastate the lives and livelihoods of millions all over the world. It is also showing us that we have the possibility and the responsibility of bouncing forward to healthier, greener, more efficient transport and mobility systems, and in ways that we can still enjoy the socioeconomic prosperity. Over the past year, many cities across different geographies have been able to transform the city space, deploying safe infrastructure for active travel, dedicating more space for businesses to still operate and people to gather all within the added recommendations. It is on our hands to keep, to turn these temporary approaches into permanent ones if we decide that this is the way to go, which I believe that deep in our hearts, we all know it is. Besides COVID-19, our societies face other challenges that we need to rise up and uh, rise up to and adapt our cities to become more resilient, healthier, and prosperous. We are seeing an increase in urbanization worldwide, and in many countries, a rapid acceleration in the aging of populations. The climate crisis has already crept upon us and is expected to continue until we decarbonize our economies quickly. All of this calls for accelerated improvements in the transport sector, a sector which has seen its emissions continue to rise while others are managing to reduce them. We know that there are tangible opportunities and confirmed solutions to make our transport and mobility systems more safer, healthier, cleaner, also more efficient. Active mobility is among the solutions as set as in the um, sustainable development goals, the ones that we have agreed that the world, the world we want to get to. To close up, I just want to finish with two quotes that have my, marked my understanding and the, of the broad impacts of transport and mobility. One of them from our colleague in Walk 21, Jim Walker, uh, when he was here in Costa Rica a few years ago. And he said that one of the first things that we learn to do in life is to walk. And that's one of the, uh, the abilities that we want, that we do not want to be taken uh, from. For example, when we get to our last years of life, we never want to uh, stop walking because that's what gives us freedom. And that marked me when he was here. And it's always nice to share with some of the, of the quotes that you get to hear. Um, in your professional life. And the other quote is from Tom Flood. He was a car advertising expert and now is turning uh, into a mobility advocate. And he says that our traditional transport planning has made us think that kids on our streets are on the way of drivers, when in reality, the drivers are on the way of children's living their life. Um, let us make transport and mobility systems that are more human, more based on active and healthy travel. And this will give us uh, the opportunity to create more livable cities and healthier ones at the same time. Over this past year, we have seen it happen in accelerated ways, not the ways that we would have wanted, but anyways, we're taking uh, the situation and making it better for everyone. And we have experienced the freedom that it gives us. It is time to, that we make this the standard. 
Thank you very much and my best wishes for such a remarkable event. Best regards. Back to you, Chris. Thank you, Arturo. That was a really nice uh, taste of some of the things we're going to be discussing in the panel and, and a good overview of a lot of the issues we've been, we'll be talking about related to walking, cycling, um, cities and health. And I think it really resonated with me when you said that transport professionals are also health professionals. I mean, that's that's really great to hear because I think it's a nice way to show the nexus um, between the things that we work on in transport and mobility and some of the key topics of urban health that we'll be focusing on in, in the wider event of the Pan-European program. So thank you very much, Arturo. Now I'd like my panelists to please turn on your videos. <laughs> Just want to make sure all the technical issues are okay. Okay, there's Bronwyn, there's Jose, and there's Carly. So welcome to the three of you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go into a bit of a conversation among our three wonderful speakers here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have some questions that I'm going to pose to them. But please keep in mind that the chat function is open for all of you to post questions. So do feel free to, to put some questions in there and I will make sure that the speakers get to them um, as we go through the conversation. First thing though, is our polls are working. So we'd like to kind of get an idea of who's with us in the room and, and what issues you're gonna be working on at your local level uh, in your cities or in your countries. So if you click on the poll feature <clears throat> uh, and hop in on the right side, you can start taking the poll. I just want to make sure everybody can access that, or maybe my speakers can help us a bit. Are you able to see the poll questions in there? Good. So let's let I'm going to give everybody just a couple of minutes to answer those questions. Okay. All right, so we have some votes coming in, and once a few more people vote, I will show the results to everybody. Okay, just a couple of more. Okay, so let me show those results. So for the first question, which issue is driving your local agenda? What are the levers or motivations? Uh, most of you have said that, oh, we still have some people voting, but most of you, nine votes, have said that there's a lack of active mobility or enhancing the infra infrastructure for active mobility. Um, others said air pollution is a big issue. And as I look out my window in New York City and see kind of the haze, I, I, can't, I can't agree more. Um, here we're seeing GHG emissions and road saf safety tying. Okay, and then COVID-19 in last place, which is interesting considering we're still more or less in the pandemic, at least in most places in the world. And then for the next poll question, which area or professional discipline are you from? Most of you are transport professionals, but keep in mind, according to Arturo, you're also health professionals. So I think we could combine the transport and health uh, options here. Uh, and then others, most of you come from then urban planning or development and some from environment. So thank you very much. I think this helps us kind of get an idea of who's in the room with us here. So if you can go back to your chat function so that you can pose questions during the conversation. So let me now introduce our speakers. We have with us here today, Bronwyn Thornton, who is the CEO of Walk 21, the Walk 21 Foundation. She's an international expert, facilitator, and trainer in walking and walkable communities. And she's leading the walking movement worldwide. She's also the chair of the Slow Cat uh, Board of Directors, so it's always great to have her with us in these events and sessions. Then we have Carly uh, Gilbert-Patrick, who's the Global Program Manager of the Share the Road Program at UNEP, the UN Environment Program. Uh, and she is a sustainable mobility professional leading the UNEP Walking and Cycling Program, supporting governments worldwide and particularly in Africa to invest in the needs of pedestrians and cyclists. So it's always great to see you, Carly. And finally, we have Jose Besselink. I think I think I said that correctly. I hope so. Um, and she is an urban planner at the city of Rotterdam, and she's been working to transform her city through public space and now is leading on walking in that city. So it's really good to have you all with us, uh, an all-female uh, panel. It's always great to have you there. Um, and what we're going to do now is I'm going to start posing the questions. And so I'd like to start 
by giving this first question to Jose. What are the policies and interventions needed to achieve and sustain a modal shift towards active mobility? So if you can tell us a bit about how you in the city of Rotterdam have been able to kind of push that modal shift towards active mobility. I think that'd be a good way to kick off our conversation. So Jose, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks. Um, well, to be honest, we have implemented our very first policy on walking last year. Uh, and our bicycle uh, policy, I think it was back in the 80s that we uh, have implemented a policy on that. Um, so I guess walking for a long time has been too obvious maybe uh, for me and my colleagues that we kind of neglected this topic uh, in the city, even though that we did invest obviously in, um, in public space, creating more and attractive places for people. Um, but, well, Bronwyn is in the panel as well. Actually, because of hosting Walk21 uh, two years ago, we have set the agenda on walking in our city. Uh, and, well, this has been uh, very important besides the paradigm shift that, that we have seen occurring in our cities worldwide, as well as in Rotterdam, um, where this um, policy also connects to. You're on mute. Mute, Chris. Sorry, I had some technical difficulties. Can you all hear me now? Okay, great. So it's it's great to hear that that link with Walk 21 being in Rotterdam kind of helped set that paradigm shift and set that agenda. Ronwin, I don't know if you want to take it up now and answer the question about that modal shift, especially considering the fact that Rotterdam had given you a bit of the floor. I think you're muted. Mute too, Bron. Sorry. Okay, is that working now? It needed a double click for some reason. <laughs> okay. um, Chris, please run the question by me again. The technical, the technical throw off there. Oh, no problem. So we're talking about the modal shift. What are the policies and interventions needed to achieve and sustain a modal shift towards that? Yeah, I think I think it's great that Josie's joined the, the panel today because I think when people think about the Netherlands, they always think about cycling. And um, the critical factor to remember when you think about the cycling agenda in the Netherlands is that it didn't start yesterday. It didn't even start last year. It didn't even start this century. You know, they've been building this agenda, as, as Jose said, since the 70s and 80s in the Netherlands. But it and, and it dem that, to me, demonstrates the critical factor you need, which is sustained and consistent application of, a, of the policy agenda. It's not a one-off thing. It's not a moment. It's not one project in one road junction in, in one, one summer. It's a, a, a consistent, sustained investment over time. It's application of that um, policy agenda across all aspects of, of how you manage a city and how you invest in the, in, in the infrastructure. And it's not it doesn't necessarily rest with the city either. Like to take the walking example sort of as a as a parallel to the cycling example of the of the Netherlands is you look at Copenhagen. Copenhagen, everyone knows the Copenhagen story, I'm sure. It's 30 years old. It's probably even 40 years old by now, actually. The decades are catching up with me. But when that started, that was just one piece of car park given to the community in the summer. And it wasn't actually originally driven by the city. It was driven by Jan Gell and Gell Architects and this whole sort of community movement that when they'd been given this public space, they didn't want to give it back. And, and so for 30 years, that incremental change over time in the city of Copenhagen, all of that was delivered before they even wrote their first strategy. But it was a consistent commitment and investment in that agenda um, over those decades. Now, you don't have to wait that long. One of the things we learned from Melbourne, Melbourne did in 10 years what Copenhagen took 30, because once you've got that political commitment and then that investment, you can speed up 
the process. And that's what we're seeing in Rotterdam. Rotterdam's not going to take that long. You know, with Josie at the helm, they've done amazing things for public space. They've created all of the destinations that you want for people to walk to. And now they're investing in, in the walking journey to enjoy those, those public spaces. And, uh, and so you can speed up this process. Ireland's doing it at a national level with big investments of, of investment and training and capacity building out to the to the local authorities. But you have to you have to embed it all all within your organization so that every time an urban or transport project is undertaken, and that's security people, that's tourism, that's all of schools, it's everybody understands that this is the priority and, and finds the way that they can deliver on that agenda as well. It's not a single department or a single uh, issue. Yeah, that kind of makes me think of, of the whole of society approach that you often see, you know, when you discuss, for example, implementing the SDGs of 2030 agenda, you really need everybody on board. And the same can be said about ensuring and promoting a paradigm shift toward active mobility. Um, so Broadwin talked a bit about Copenhagen, Rotterdam, Melbourne. Carly, I don't know if you want to kind of give a bit of your reflections maybe in your work with African cities. It might be an interesting way to kind of juxtapose the two examples. So Carly, the floor is yours. Let us know your reflections on this. Thank you. I want to start by saying I was also in Rotterdam and I bought my favorite pair of walking boots there that I'm still wearing two <laughs> years later. So that's that's my Rotterdam link. Um, and I think actually, you know, what Jose and Bron have said uh, applies globally. And I think probably the only extra intervention I wanted to talk about was this consultation and citizen engagement. And I think, you know, there are cities in Europe that are facing the same issues as cities in Africa. And there are cities in Europe that are different issues. And I always try to remind myself in the work that we do supporting governments that there's no one size fits all. And I think it's actually often easy to forget that even as professionals, you know, with all of these kind of generic toolkits, follow these 10 steps and your city will be walkable or follow these 20 steps and you can have a cycling city and all the design guidelines and policy recommendations. But, you know, I, I think I'm a bit biased, but I think sustainable mobility is one of the most complex systems, you know, in any city. And it's so dynamic and there are so many different dimensions and so many different stakeholders. And every single city, every neighborhood is a kind of one of a kind case. So I think, the, you know, one of those first key interventions is just being able to take that first step and understanding your individual context and engaging with citizens. And, you know, we always talk about stakeholder consultation, but actually genuinely trying to understand the dynamics of different groups, vulnerable groups, subgroups, and really using that and the, getting that baseline and using it to kind of integrate into the steps you then take, which is setting that clear vision and putting a budget against things and all of those future interventions. I think for me, the founding intervention is that engagement. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I mean, stakeholder engagement is a key element in implementing any policies that are that affect a wide swath of the population. So it's really good to kind of bring us back to that element. Um, Josie, I don't know if you want to tell us a bit of some of the maybe the obstacles you faced in trying to kind of promote this modal shift um, in Rotterdam. What are some of the issues you might have had the challenges in, in pushing more active mobility in the city? Well, Mm, the first obstacle was um, within the organization. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm I'm on a mission, uh, convincing my colleagues. Um, uh, and what really helps is um, opening internal doors with external expertise, like with the Walk Twenty One Foundation. But we have also invited Jan Gill, by the way in 2008 that really helped um and related to what carly uh just said about involving citizens um policy is important of course but it's only a framework and we need to um translate this to uh, action and um start redesigning our streets so an important part of our strategy um um, our experiments and tactical interventions to um, make people in our city aware of the mobility transition that we are facing 
show them what the city of tomorrow could look like, for example, with these small parklets. Uh, we also have bicycle parklets. We, we um, did other interventions with closing down streets, for example. Um, so I think policy is the first step, then doing pilots uh, uh, where we engage the local community and local change makers collaborate with them and then look back to your policy. I think that's another important uh, part um, to learn from, from uh, the things that we, well, do in our streets and um, uh, make these policy documents a more flexible instrument. I think that's another important topic. That's true. I mean, sometimes a lot of these policy frameworks can seem very one size fits all. Um, and, and I think based on what the three of you have already said, you have to be very context specific. Not everything, you know, not everything can be done the same way. You have different interests, different stakeholder groups that are involved in different places, different economic priorities and social priorities. So you really have to see how flexible these documents can be. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, we have a question in the chat for Bronwyn. I, I think Bronwyn tried to answer it a bit in the chat, but it's an interesting question, I think, um, because it talks about how walking and cycling could be so pedestrian and, and boring. And how can you market it to make it more interesting, to make it more engaging? Um, as a, Again, as a New Yorker, I mean, we walk everywhere, at least in certain parts of the city. And because there's so much to see, so much to do, of course you want to do it. But how would you explain that to other people, Bronwyn, in your... Uh, in, in your leadership, at least in Walk 21, promoting this kind of active mobility. Yeah, thanks very much, Chris. And hi, Randy. Thank you for the the question. Nice to see you in the in the session. It um, it's always one of those things that people always tell us you can't tell us that you can't sell walking. But what we have seen from studying different cities is that you don't actually have to sell walking if you create the, the environment that enables walking and invites people to walk. And when I say that, I don't just mean by providing a sidewalk or a, a, um, or a crossing, but it's giving people enough time to cross. It's making them feel safe to cross. It's constraining traffic. It is about speed. It is about creating an environment where we communicate that people walking are valuable and make it so that people feel confident allowing their children to choose to walk. So it's not, you can't market something if you haven't got the context in which you can invite people to participate. It's like when they put bike share up in some cities where there's no bike lanes and wonder why nobody rides them. You know, it's sort of like you have to have both of those elements, but a good walking environment will market itself Alternatively, you make walking the most efficient and effective way to get to where you're going. And that's when you look at restraining vehicle movement. And um, there's, again, um, in Europe. Ah, Randy, OK, I see your uh, I see your, your switch there. So let me finish on this one. But when you design a city like that says we're going to make it nicer to walk and um, I have completely forgotten the name of the town where they put the train station in the middle and all the cars can only circulate on the round, the ring road and all the movement within the town is by walking and cycling and they don't have anyone dying and all the children walk and cycle to school and people catch public transport. So we can build it in and invite people. For selling it to policymakers, I think that's part of the discussion today and it's a critical question because we have to sell the benefits of walking and usually they used to sell it to transport people by the co-benefits, the health benefits, the community cohesion benefits, the, the social impact benefits. But we can sell walking on the transport benefits now as well. They've measured the impact on walkable catchments to support underpin public transport. And we're coming to this in our questions, I know, Chris, so I'm just going to just brush on them a little bit initially, is that you identify how walking addresses multiple agendas at the same time and you recognize those levers and we're getting more and more tools to actually measure those benefits so the flow project that we did the european project i really recommend looking that up because that answers the congestion 
question. But before we even answer the traffic paradigm questions is maybe we should redefine the paradigm because traffic congestion is all premised on the idea of time and delay and, and, and road capacities and things like that. And so we are trying to define human movement, people movement in a motorized traffic environment. So we need to, to challenge both sit within that traffic uh, paradigm, but also challenge it to say there's other ways of measuring value in our communities, particularly for walking when it addresses the thing for a health agenda is you want people to walk more. You don't want to reduce the time that they spend walking. You want to enable them to get the health benefit over time. Yeah, and, and, and thank you, Ron, for kind of bringing up, right, the nexus among these agendas that we're talking about in this wider program. Um, a question that I want to pose now to Carly is, is how do we harness the different agendas of health, transport, environment to deliver these co-benefits, these shared outcomes? What are some of the key points of collaboration? I mean, in the Share the Road program, you're doing just that, right? You're working across environmental health and transport agendas. So how do we manage, harness, how do we get these shared outcomes to really be highlighted, right? And, and to ensure that policymakers are feeling convinced to actually implement some of the things that we're working on. Thanks. Um, you know, I always think, I think we can all agree that mobility is an essential aspect of life. I mean, there's not much that you can do without it and no one is in the lack of environmental and health benefits in, in investing in active mobility. You know, even if you just look at the agenda for the side events over the next few days, walking and cycling is at the center of everything. <laughs> So I think actually at the strategic level, or if you like the justification level, the agenda's nicely complementary. Invest in active mobility, reap the health and environmental benefits. I can't imagine a health, a heart surgeon anywhere complaining that more people are walking or cycling. And I actually think we're quite lucky because, you know, when you, when, when you work on walking and cycling, you clearly show the benefits across all segments, health, air quality, road safety, congestion, equity. I don't think, actually, I know you can't say the same for any other mode, even if it's sustainable. Walking and cycling hit all of those benefits and we're getting better, I think, as a community, like Bron mentioned, on valuing, on showing the value or presenting the business case. I think really the challenge comes with the way cities and national governments and international organizations divvy up our work. It's why you have WHO, then you've got UN Habitat, then you've got me with UN Environment, and it trickles down to national governments, regional networks, city governments. The money often sits with the transport department. They're responsible for kind of coming up with the policies, implementing, and then the health and environment departments, if you like, are these, you know, inactive beneficiaries of whatever the transport officials decide to do or not to do. So what we're trying to do at, at UNEP and Share the Road is within our scope of power to work across those different agendas. So I think the trick is whatever level you're working at, neighborhood, city, national, regional, ask yourself, how can I work in hand with other people who are not traditionally my friends? So, you know, if you have the remit, set up an interagency working group or find ways to consult. So we're trying to do it, but it's it's hard, it's not easy. When we support governments with developing national policies, often that responsibility sits with the Ministry of Transport and we invite the Ministry of Health and we invite education and tourism, but they don't necessarily turn up because they don't see walking and cycling as their bag. So it's, it's a constant work in pro progress, but that's what we're trying to do. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, this, this, this effort towards vertical integration among different departments and governments is always a challenge. Um, you know, part of the reason is not because people don't want to collaborate. They just have so much work to do in their own specific agenda and their own little world that they sometimes don't have the time or the energy or even the thought process to go out of sight of that. And so going back to you, Josie, um, from the city perspective, what are some of the things that you have done maybe in Rotterdam to bridge those gaps? between all these agendas, among these agendas, um, with your other colleagues. You had mentioned before that it's actually one of the challenges you faced in the work that you're doing. And what are some of maybe the activities? I, I know Rotterdam has some really good municipal level policies related to this. Has that helped? Um, yeah, I guess the, the, um, the way we work in Rotterdam and in the Netherlands in general is that we do collaborate a lot with other uh, departments. Um, even though we 
we also have these silos, obviously, but in the beginning, I was slightly alone, um, walking and cycling. I'm also in the cycling team, uh, but the walking strategy, it goes beyond mobility and urban planning. So uh, I became friends with my colleagues of the health department, um, maintenance, sports. We have involved safety. Uh, there's colleagues of the department that's responsible for accessibility. So in the meantime, we, ha we have arranged a program team interdepartmental with a program manager that is not only related to the urban development department, but she's responsible for this integral approach. And I think this is key um, because this enables us to connect. Uh, walking is this crossover topic and we can now connect our um, objectives to the ones that are uh, that we have in this new uh, sports uh, ambition, as well as in, in the health uh, the local um, health uh, prevention agreement, for example. And um, I think this is um, the way it should work, but it, it's been hard to, uh, to organize this because uh, it's not that obvious for um, us civil servants to um, uh, go beyond your own uh, department but i think we're heading to that and i think the ambition document that we have implemented last year is a good example of the way uh, it should work and we are now heading towards an action plan actually we we are already working on that and there's also a few new projects um, launched in that plan where we collaborate with the same team as well on a local neighborhood level and then engage the community as well. Yeah, that's really, that's, oh, Bron, I don't know if you wanted to respond to that. I see your hand going up. Hey, Chris, you, you go. No, no, I, I was just going to say, it's, it's good to hear that those, you know, there are efforts to do this work. So I don't know if you wanted to, to take a, a shot at responding to that as well. Yeah, the thing I wanted to pick up on was when I um, first started working with local authorities in the UK to bring them together, like Jose talked about, with Rotterdam to talk about walking. And we'd get 30 people, 40 people in a room to talk about it. And lots of different places, actually, I'm thinking now that we've done this. And you suddenly find them all really busy talking to each other. And you're like, hang on a minute, we're here to talk about walking. And the whole room said, yeah, but we never see each other. So this collaboration issue, it's not just a challenge for, for walking and cycling. We have to address it. We have to overcome it, but not to feel that we're unique in that respect. It's just the, it's the nature of the beast and all these organizations work hard to, you know, break down those silos or, and, 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 and find those, those opportunities for connection and, and, and activity. So it's not to feel disheartened by that. It's a very common challenge in local authorities and in, in governments generally. And um, in the last session I was in, we were talking a lot about national, uh, well, that, that, that I watched uh, talking about national plans and um, and the importance of, of having a strong guide, like a steer, like an op someone who's really sitting in the middle, bringing those agendas together. And that's what Jose is doing in, um, in Rotterdam. And that's what we see Carly doing across Africa and different places. You do have that sort of a strong hub in the middle that holds all the threads together to make it coherent and then helps identify the value that walking offers to those different agendas. Sometimes you have to do more work you know, in the middle than you would imagine initially. But until these different parts of your, your puzzle actually own it, and can see the value that investing in in walking and cycling does for for their agenda. And and just as a as a a couple of quick examples, when I did this once, when one of these examples I'm thinking of, it uh, we had the the waste management, you know, the the trash as you would call it, Chris. You know, they the, the waste management guys were in the room. We had the street lighting, you know, team in the room when we were talking about some interventions in Hounslow in West London. And um, and we've done an audit and we stand there and we say, so it's the first thing we notice is the quality of the street lighting or you say something and everyone goes, oh, that's Simon. Simon, you're not doing your job. You know, now Simon's <laughs> never, you know, he's never thought about walking. He's never thought that he was making an active contribution to the walking agenda. But suddenly Simon's got a job, you know, and he's been sort of 
uh, got that energy in the space for realizing that they can make a difference and they might not always you know see what that opportunity is and so part of our task is to is to highlight that, is to share with people what those opportunities are. And one of the places that I feel really heartened by is in the road safety agenda. And we're, you know, if we're talking about the junction of health and transport, we talk a lot about physical activity and we talk a lot about clean air, but the road safety agenda, the paradigm shift that's been happening over the last few years, you know, when we wrote the, the walking charter in 2006, we didn't say, we didn't use the expression road safety. We talked about road danger reduction because we start with humans we start with the people in the space and we want people to be the design standard for that space so then you have to measure the danger that the rest of the environment and reduce the danger that that poses and this has been happening in the broader community which talks about a safe systems approach and what happened last year is the evolution of this and this is what's so heartening is that the UN resolution built on the Stockholm Declaration around to launch the second decade of uh, action for road safety. So there's been a broad acceptance of a safe systems approach and we know very much that if you make it safer for walking and cycling, you make it safer for everybody, you create a much safer system. But what that strategy actually recognized was that we have to invest in mode shift to achieve road safety. We can't, we're not about boxing people into their different modes and making each mode safe, but we actually have to encourage people. We have to build safe infrastructure and encourage people into walking and cycling to achieve road safety outcomes. And this is the cross fertilization you get between those different agendas. And so in agencies where you're in charge of land transport and safety, for example, you suddenly have a reason to invest more in walking and cycling because you're gonna fulfill your, your safety objectives at the same time. And if you're in charge of public transport and not building walkable catchments, which isn't historically what they did, they used to build really lovely systems and stations and vehicles. But if you're not investing in your walking and cycling catchments, as Washington Metro discovered, they discovered the best way to underpin the fiscal viability of their service and increase ridership was to invest in walking and cycling to their stations. So if you're not you can demonstrate to people that if you're not leveraging walking and cycling for your agenda, you're missing out on a whole swathe of A, opportunity and B, impact. Yeah, I mean, that's that's super interesting because I, I, I'm i almost imagining the Washington DC Metro Broadway because um, it does expand out into the suburbs. And I've noticed a lot of changes over the years when I used to visit a lot in Washington, um, that there was actually a lot more infrastructure for walking and cycling included eventually. But I just remember in the beginning, it was just these suburban train stations where people would yeah. just come in. It's a critical <laughs> example, actually, Chris. It's a really good example because Washington Metro was built for suburbs. It wasn't built for high density. It was built yeah. for the DC suburbs. And everyone thinks you need high density for successful transport. But what they did, they, they did an analysis of all their stations. It's the most fantastic report, which they've integrated into their design standards and into their investment strategies over the last 10 years to make the changes. That you're that you're seeing and they've had those ridership impacts they did the math on how their ridership could increase um, as a result of that work and we see them using the same philosophy in sydney as they're building new metro lines out into the suburbs of sydney as well okay so i want to actually shift now a bit to some macro policy issues related to the sdgs uh because now we've heard a lot about from the city of Rotterdam. Ron gave us some really interesting examples from different places around the world. Carly was talking a bit about the work that she's doing at UNEP um, related to working with governments on, on these issues. But now I wanna kind of focus on the sustainable development goals. And I wanna kind of pose this question to any of you. And what I wanna know is how does the enabling and enhancing of active mobility support in the achievement in sustainable development, both short and long term. I know in, in the concept note for the session, we actually highlighted specific SDGs that are impacted by scaling up active mobility in infrastructure, promoting active mobility. Carly, I don't know if you want to take a shot at this first question. Maybe you want to let us know some of the impacts on the SDGs that this kind of work might have, especially coming from the UN background. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, a few months ago, I actually I was writing a proposal to a donor and one of the and it was um, about a year ago and it was for a cycling and walking project in three African countries. And, you know, they were like, give us a paragraph on how this project will contribute 
to the SDGs. And it was at that point that I realized that actually, and it's, it's a bit of a travesty, and I think most of us in the walking and cycling world will say this, that, it's, that walking and cycling is not specifically pulled out in the SDGs at either the high, at the goals or the targets. Because I, my, by my calculations, there are at least 12 of the 17 goals that cannot be achieved without walking and cycling, without active mobility. And, you know, you look at whether you're looking at poverty reduction, whether you're looking at safety, whether you're looking at smart cities, gender inclusion, they all need, I think, okay, maybe the ocean, maybe the oceans go doesn't need walking and cycling. But pretty much apart from that, it's hard to see how any of these goals can be achieved without walking and cycling. So I think the question is, for me, it's not, you know, which, how do, how does walking and cycling contribute to the goals? Because they pretty much contribute to all of them. For me, the bigger question, working at a, at a, you know, a global agency is why, what do we need to do better as an industry, you know, to get ourselves represented when we're so fundamental, like why are we being missed out? And I think, you know, part of it is doing better at working cross, um, cross partnerships, but I, I don't quite have the answer, but I think, you know, we definitely need to, to do something because they should be in there. Thank you. Well, I mean, I wouldn't even say goal 14 on, on oceans and, and underwater life is, is not, doesn't have some kind of secondary you've, impact. You've got to walk to the ocean. You've got to walk or cycle <laughs> to get to the ocean. Well, I mean, there's, there's the ocean would certainly benefit from more people walking and cycling. Yeah, and so, um, you know, it, it definitely is. It's it's so holistic in how you would look at it. I don't know, Jose, you want to follow up with that. Has um, have there been any considerations of the SDGs, the 2030 agenda in the work you're doing in Rotterdam? Yeah, um, I don't think it as an kind of an overarching umbrella in everything we do. It's not that we have a checklist with, in our, when we produced this walking strategy, we didn't check the uh, SDGs, but on a higher macro level, of course, it is related to the SDGs. Um, and uh, I just checked up, there's, uh, for example, a neighborhood uh, development plan and there they specifically paid attention to the uh, sustainable development goals. So it is a topic within the organization. We are also um, 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 collaborating on this with other cities. Next week, for example, there's a meeting how to accelerate our uh, um, SDGs up till 2030. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it is a topic, but on a more a higher skill level and my uh, job personally is more related um uh it, it might be another way of working it's more a concrete project that i'm working in for example so yeah no of course i mean these are these are like i said much more macro national policy issues that come from mm -hmm. the global level right um, but there are some interesting developments happening in some cities where they're doing a local 2030 agenda like local SDG reviews and, and, and things like that. So there's quite interesting developments happening in cities. And it's good to hear that in, in Rotterdam, it's almost like this umbrella um, that yeah. we're doing the work for it. Yeah, in, for example, the um, spatial development plan for the, um, I think, 2040 perspective citywide, there is related to, so on that kind of uh, level, it, it definitely is. and. Um, we also, for example, have a local climate agreement. Um, so yeah, there's lots of things been written about it um, and lots of policy documents as well. Yeah, I mean, over 60%, I think it is, of, of the world's population lives in urban areas. And if cities don't implement these these policies, then you know what's, what's the point in many ways? Exactly, um, yeah. So Bronwyn, I don't know if you wanna reflect a bit on this question as well since you've kind of taken the lead in this conversation about promoting and selling these policies, how can you maybe couch that in the context of the SDGs and the 2030 agenda? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. It, um, it's in, I mean, Carly is absolutely right about, you know, we can't walk on water yet, but we can, we can do something. 
for all of these items, you know, with walking. And in some and, and the lack of walking and cycling was not a lack of effort at the time. And I think what's really interesting is that how hard transport had to negotiate around the SDGs at the time, and also how um, much the conversation has shifted since the SDGs were adopted. I don't think you would get the SDGs done this year without walking and cycling in them. And, and so whilst you could feel the, the, um, the sting of not getting a, a direct mention in, in the SDGs at the time, once you actually start to, you know, once we've moved on, the agenda has moved on so much and the opportunities for investing in walking and cycling uh, supported by the SDGs is so great. And what's really interesting is the gender conversation, which is well captured in the SDGs, is um, continues to expand and expand in, in the transport um, arena. And again, you see the impact on, on the agenda um, SDG because it is women who walk more with children and, and, and make the decisions for their families around the transport and the travel that they do. Um, so, so there's all these different ways that the SDGs underpin the way that you can approach and, and think about walking. And one of the things that we're working on with that, so 11.2 is the most obvious entry point where it's about proximity to, to public transport. And in a classic example, there's no measure of quality either of the service that they might be proximate to or the journey that, that you travel there. But once you've defined that as a target and you've defined and understand that you want to actually enable this much space around a public transport service to be accessible so that people can get there, then you've got that lever to go and invest in the walking and cycling access through those, through those catchments. So that's a very specific place um, but the challenge with walking and cycling is, is that it happens at that city level, but all of these global agendas are managed at, an, at a national level. And we're starting as well to see that connection between national agendas and local agendas emerging more and more. So I would say in Europe, we've had a lot more action at a, at a city level feeding up into that national agenda, whereas perhaps Carly would see that in Africa, the work that the community has been doing has been more at a national level, trying to, to, to roll the impact down into an intercity level um, action and application. And uh, it's, it's the, we've talked about inter-government silos between different departments, but this government up and down, you know, um, support and, and discussion is really critical as well. Okay, so I don't know if Josie, you saw that there was a question from from Jim Walker in the chat, um, saying that it's good to hear that there is action plans. But as more and more people develop policy, would you recommend action plans for everyone? And why now and not before? So just wanted to pose that question to you from the chat. And as a reminder, everybody, the chat is open. So do feel free to post questions or make comments. Uh, thank you. Um, well, Policy, it starts with policy, but um, I'm also convinced that just policy is nothing. So we need to move from talking to doing. And this is why we are still writing the action plan, because this is all politics and it takes a long time, but we are already working on it. So, for example, a campaign on uh, decluttering the pavement. Um, making uh we, we're developing design principles we are we want to start a, a behavioral uh campaign there's lots of things um in this action plan that um in of which we try to translate these uh goals and ambitions on a visionary level towards more concrete projects on a local level uh, so I would definitely recommend uh, everyone to also um, implement action plans, yes. Okay, so that's a nice call to action, I think, to, to promote that kind of approach to, to getting this work done. Um, Robin, I just, oh yeah, go ahead, Robin. I just wanted to share another example that's very similar to what Josie's taken the approach, and that's in Queensland, Australia, which is a, like a provincial or state government. Um, it's got three layers of government in Australia and they wrote a Queensland walking strategy and a two year action plan. And so they recognize exactly what Jose is saying, which is set that ambition, set that framing, 
but get on with something straight away so that it's got visible immediate impact to grow that to grow that momentum and they actually found it quite challenging they said this is what money we've got and it has to deliver in the next two years you know to really sharpen the the attention and and it's very easy to be long-term ambitious and it's very easy to to do all of that big picture they found it harder to write the action plan but ultimately it's now you know paying off and you know we are going to be talking about that at the conference at the end of the month, Wall 21 Seoul. Uh, we've got a whole session talking about implementation of government agendas. And we've got that example from Queensland, if people are um, interested. I know Josie's going to be there with the Rotterdam story as well. But I think that balance between the framing and the action is something that is really changing the momentum that walking projects get. Yeah, to add, uh, maybe we are using the action plan, the short term action plan to also set the agenda for the longer term. And it all relates back to this long term ambition. So it's kind of an how is it iterative. No, I don't know the if I pronounce it right, but this is the way we work. Yeah, I mean, this it's important to have some kind of vision that kind of helps populate the short term because the vision is kind of like okay this is what we want to achieve in the long term and then you know that helps you kind of get to where you're going in the shorter term policy actions um but i want to kind of pick up on something bronwyn had brought up before about the gender elements of the sdgs and that kind of made me think about some of the issues we've been dealing with now with covid 19 right because oftentimes the ones who are most vulnerable to the worst impacts of covid are um, you know, the ones who are most marginalized and most vulnerable in society and talking about how active mobility has actually been, is an important part of ensuring implementation of SDG 5 on gender equality. It also makes me think about how has COVID also impacted these social groups because, you know, these sustainable development talks also about social development. Um, so talking about COVID, I don't know if Carly, you want to pick up on this um, looking at some of the issues related to COVID and how that might have had an impact on cities or, or governments scaling up active mobility or trying to at least see how to make that shift towards increased active mobility more permanent. So just let us know what you think on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess the first thing is when COVID hit, we, you know, we all started thinking about COVID, thinking it would all be over in six months. And here we still are kind of, you know, over a year later, still working out what the impact is. But without a doubt, I mean, I think, you know, COVID has been a magnifying glass on mobility, maybe more than any other industry or sector. And it's changed, you know, one, our need to move in the first place and definitely how we move. And I think, you know, whilst it's obviously a disaster, in many ways, it's also shone a light on how important having an integrated transport system is. And that whilst bus rapid transit can be fantastic and has always been the popular kid at high school, actually, it's really shown that, you know, you need to have integration. It can't be public transport on its own. You need to be able to walk safely. Um, so, you know, we've had and we've had to rethink how we use public transport. Whilst there are risks, it will always remain an essential service. We've had to think about how to rapid, cities have had to rapidly introduce low cost cycling infrastructure. And, and I think going back to this kind of inter partner working, COVID has shown how well the transport and health sectors can work together when they really need to. And you know, I think my my other point is it's shown what a difference mobility makes between being able to stay safe and connected and having huge isolation. So, you know, you, you look at cities where they've been proactive, they've got good public transport, they provided safe infrastructure and how that's allowed the most vulnerable to still move around and be connected compared to cities that haven't done so and how quickly people are isolated. So yeah, it's really been a magnifying glass for mobility. And whilst we can't predict, you know, the future, I think what we can do is use this window to kind of build back better and safer and healthier and more accessible mobility systems. Yeah, and, and just picking up a bit of what Arturo was saying in the opening session, in the opening segment about mental health issues, right? If you're talking about isolation because of COVID, I mean, we've seen how that had a huge impact on people's mental health. 
um, because they just felt like they were stuck or trapped in a single place for a long amount of time. Their employment issues were, were also being magnified by it. So it created a lot of these mental health strife um, around the world. And at least with some access to green spaces and mobility, that could have helped alleviate some of that pressure and some of those problems. Uh, Josie, did you want to let us know a bit of what Rotterdam was doing uh, in the midst of COVID? And I, I know it's still happening everywhere, but what were some of the policy and what were some of the policies around active mobility that the city took in order to help deal with the COVID crisis? Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, we already had some experience on running these pilots with parklets and closing of streets. So when COVID uh, arrived, we were uh, able to swiftly respond. And uh, there was a project, for example, where the city has offered free parklets uh, with circular wood, uh, over a thousand uh, it were, I believe. And they, it was um, offered to local entrepreneurs to create outdoor terraces. But at the same time, it uh, uh, created more space on the pavement because that has been a struggle. Uh, lots of um, uh, terraces were allowed to um, enlarge their uh, area, but if you're walking there or if you're in a wheelchair, uh, the, uh, there were some examples where the pavement, um, that there, it was just obstacles on the pavement. So we have had some issues on that. Um, another thing we did was uh, temporary closing down streets where we have seen there was too much traffic, uh, for example, during weekends or uh, in the evenings. Um, and um, it might be interesting to mention uh, the, the city, the, the Board of Aldermen has launched a massive architectural plan. So besides these small interventions, they also decided during, uh, in the midst of a crisis, to launch this investment of over 230 uh, million euros in seven projects to add more green and create more attractive places for people. So I think it was both related to um, create more space for people immediately, and at the same time, start thinking about the future uh, and in, start investing in more people-friendly spaces for the future. Thank you very much, Josie. Uh, it's good to hear that a lot of those policies were implemented and were probably very beneficial to the population of the city when, when they were in the midst of everything. Bronwyn, I want to ask you, has, has the pandemic unveiled any hidden benefits to walking? None of the benefits are hidden. They're all out there. <laughs> no, what's been really interesting with the pandemic is how um, I think the two things that it really helped for people is to learn their local environment a little bit, to understand actually that things were quite walkable and quite close in a way that when you move around in a, a, a vehicle, you actually warps your sense of time and distance and, and how long it might take you to get somewhere. And so I think the but at an individual level, COVID was fantastic in enabling people to learn that things were closer, uh, perhaps, than they than they realised. What, what we saw, which was, I mean, initially, you know, walking did save the day. It enables people to get out and to still connect to their local communities. But when that is your only opportunity, um, those communities with vast tracts of sprawl and urban form that didn't have anywhere to go within walking distance, you know, in terms of, I know in South Africa, and maybe Carla can pick this up, but in South Africa, they actually brought food vans into neighborhoods because people couldn't get out to go to, to, to access, you know, some of those opportunities. And so that sort of impact and understanding of how that urban form impacts on our mobility really came home in the, in the COVID situation. The thing that I, I found really exciting about COVID and that sort of is, is the opportunity that in municipalities took. They've been, the ones that really rolled out fast like Milan and, and London and places, these they have had plans on the shelves for years to try and make a difference. And it shows how important it is to have those ideas and those plans ready. And then when, when 
the silver lining of COVID is that you can take that opportunity to put some of these things in place. Even with kickback afterwards, people have learned that things can be different and you can hold a line for a little bit longer. So that rollout and investment of infrastructure and, and access, we've seen that come as, as a result of the COVID um, priorities. The final thing I want to mention is working from home and the mental health because I was rightly in a really interesting discussion and I was rightly reminded by a mental health professional that working from home is not always great for people's mental health. They can continue to feel isolated like we might have felt isolated during COVID. But if we improve local access and local services and local neighbourhoods, then people can still have those opportunities to go out and connect with others on a walking journey. Um, in their in their local neighborhoods. So we have to see that we have to, whilst we might have given back, especially some people in Nairobi, we've given them back four hours a day because they're not commuting into the office anymore. We need to look after them with that localized services and, and, and opportunities and invest in walking in local neighborhoods, not just always in city centers or in what we always historically perceived as those high density pedestrian areas. We have to build it all the way out through our, our community. Absolutely. And Carly, I know that Robert had mentioned a bit of the South Africa example. Did you want to expand on that a bit? Yeah, just to pick up on that example, but also what Bron just said about, you know, localized services. And actually, in the Africa context, we're not lacking localized services. There are little shops and spaces to kind of come together all over. You know, it's actually very decentralized. The problem is, even though you can walk somewhere to pick up your fruit for the day, five minutes away, that five minute journey can still get you killed. So it's, it's yes, it's, it's just thinking about it all in a holistic way. So it's yes, having access to localized service, but people need to feel safe and comfortable reaching that localized service, because if not, they will get in their car, even if it's five minutes away, because if they have a choice to do it in a way they perceive as safer, even if it's causing congestion and it's bad for the environment, they'll always choose that. And I think going back to that individual context, that's also the same for some parts of European cities. Like, you know, I think Jim mentioned it in a previous um, in the previous side event that 30 percent of trips in Europe are less than half an hour. So, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean 30 percent of trips are not being walked, but they could be. But why are they not be? And that's what we need to ask ourselves. It's a very good question, um, it's especially interesting to hear that, because, you know, people, I think, as as Bron was mentioning, may not have thought that the things they were going to by car were actually closer than they thought. Um, and maybe that could be one of the silver linings of COVID, considering all the negative impacts it, ha it has had. It could be one of the possible benefits of, of this pandemic. Um, we don't have too much time left. So I did want to give each of the speakers the opportunity to give any last or final reflections. And Arturo, you're included in this as well, if you want to give any final thoughts or reflections. So I'll start with, with, with Josie to let us know if she has any final thoughts on, on anything we've been talking about in this wider session. Some final thoughts. Um, let's summarize it as we need policy, we need to do pilots, we need to involve our local heroes, and we need to uh, loop this all back to our uh, long-term goals and ambitions. Very succinct and very helpful. Okay, um, Broadwin. Muted. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I was still composing, uh, I was <laughs> composing in my head. Um, I think, I think the thing with any of this is that as we we often use the expression in Walk Twenty One, and we've done it um, for twenty one years now, is that people walking are the indicator species for the quality of life in your cities. So we see that when people take photographs of their cities, they take pictures of people in public space. They don't take pictures of supermarket car parks. They don't take pictures of industrial wasteland. All of these things are a part of that. But the lifeblood of our cities is, is, is the people and people out and about on foot. And whether picking up on what Arturo very you know kindly quoted earlier, whether it's for our very youngest people, not even 
like even before they can walk, they can be out and about in public space with carers who are walking. You know, this is a critical factor for, for, for babies and, and toddler development in developing independence. You know, teenagers, they want to be independent. Old people don't want to give up their independence, but we design environments that don't enable them to, to feel comfortable in that, in that space. And I think we have to just remember that instead of having a motorized vehicle and high speed and a traffic paradigm as the design standard for our cities, we start with the human, the, the human being as our design standard and we work outwards from there. It doesn't mean we don't have highways. It doesn't mean we don't have motorized travel and big transport systems. It's all part of the mix. But we have to just remember that it's a mix. It's a mix of all these things. And it's a balance between all of those elements and to ensure that we've given them all the right priority in the right place. Um, and it's more places than most people give them at the moment. Thank you. OK, Carly. Thanks. Um, I think picking up from what Ron said, it's a balance. And currently, we're completely off balance. It's, you know, it's not the right mix. And, you know, if we take a step back and you know, 2020 was a winner, but not not the winner that we wanted. It was the hottest year on record ever recorded, tying with 2016. Um, and, you know, even though the COVID pandemic has caused a little dip in emissions, it's not bringing us any closer to meeting the Paris Agreement climate goals. Um, and, you know, I want to just quote the UNEP um, emissions gap report that we produced last year. So it's not just me here. It's actually this report that was put together by 50 world leading scientists from 35 institutions. And they've said that two thirds of global emissions are linked to private households and individual behavior. And that's made up of mobility, residential and the food sectors. And each of them contributes about 20 percent. And the report goes on to say that governments have got to enable consumers to make the right choices. You can you can tell people to stop using plastic straws as much as you want, but until you stop making them available, things don't change. And the report goes on to say that active mobility is a key solution to meet those Paris um, climate goals. So, uh, you know, and I just think that the multi-sector partnerships are the only thing that are going to get us to achieve those active mobility goals. And actually the Transport Health Environment Partnership I think is one of the strongest or could be one of the strongest. So yeah, we should, you know, cycling is smart and walking works. Very succinct, thank you. And finally, Arturo, any last words before we close off the side event? Thanks, no, it's been very interesting to, to be listening to all of you. And in the end, what I can get from it, and it's something that uh, I think needs to be said is that Transportation has too many objectives, and we've gone through a lot of them here. Gender, affordability, health, um, environmental aspects, economic development. We have to understand that all of the transport modes contribute to this, whether it's positive or negative. And in the end, there's no silver bullet for anything, and not even in transport. And we have to understand who we are trying to, to bring our solutions to and make them adequate to those contexts. Because in the end, we can't pretend to have metros in cities that barely can, or the, for populations that barely have a dollar per day and things like that. We need to understand who we provide the solutions to, to make them the more or, or the most adequate for them and to contribute in the end to, to the greater development or to the greater prosperity. Thank you very much, Arturo. Thank you very much, Josie, Carly, Bronwyn. It was really great to have this conversation with you, talking about really promoting an important element of achieving sustainable development and reaching our climate targets, really, um, in places all over the world, because we need people-centered, planet-sensitive policies, and walking and cycling can certainly help us in achieving those goals. It's not just about individual change, as you were saying before, Carly. We need policies to ensure um, the achievement of all of these objectives. And certainly all of us can continue to work together to do that. It's great to be here with all of you. If any of our participants would like access to any material or resources from SLOWCAT, uh, from Walk21, from, from UNEP, we are sharing a Google Doc with you in the chat. So we have tons of resources in there and you could also go to our websites to find out more. And we'll be happy to, to share that information with you further. 
So thank everyone for participating. Thank you again to our speakers and our panelists. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the Pan-European program. Take care, everybody.